Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another book discussion between the NRA's Book Club and Ann Arbor District Library. Tonight, we are here to discuss the novel, We Measure the Earth with Our Bodies. And this is by Tsering Yang Zum Lama. And before we get started, we can just go around quickly, maybe and introduce ourselves and give a brief visual description if you're comfortable with that. So I'll go ahead and start. I'm Lucy. I'm a... Um, library technician in the youth department, but I do a lot of book discussions and other adult events as well. I have shoulder length brown hair, I'm wearing glasses and a blue and white striped shirt, and I'm sitting in front of a wall with some drawings in the background. Hi, I'm Emily. I am a librarian at the Ann Arbor District Library. Uh, my collection is youth fiction, but for events, I work with adults. I am a white woman in my mid-30s. I have uh, long brownish red hair and long braids that actually go below the screen. I am wearing a green sweater and I am sitting in front of a mostly white wall with a copy of Matisse's Goldfish behind me. Hi, I'm Anne. I work at the Westgate branch of the library. I'm a book processor and uh, I am a mid 40s white woman with long brown hair, slightly graying in a blue paisley shirt in front of a white wall with a black shelf above it. And hi, folks. My name is Fatima Hawk. I am one of the co-facilitators of Unerased Book Club, where we read and discuss Asian American literature. I am a South Asian uh, brown woman with black hair. Um, I'm wearing a blue and white striped shirt, and I have a digital background of um, the Chittagong skyline behind me. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, I appreciate having the chance to talk about this book with you. It has a lot of phenomenal themes just for our listeners. We measure the earth with our bodies. It follows a family um, through China's invasion of Tibet in the 1950s and then all the way through, through to their migration as refugees to Nepal and then to Canada. And I'd just love to start off by asking folks uh, what your impressions were of the book and how you felt about it. I really enjoy um, reading a book like this. And it's funny because I don't tend to pick them up on my own until someone I care about says, you should read this book. But I love a family epic. And I thought that this, one of the neat ways about this is it wasn't just told chronologically. Uh, and so it allowed for the story to unfold in uh, an engaging way as a reader. Uh, I also found it helpful to see that things turned out sort of okay for some of the characters um, before reaching the end of the book, because it is... I mean, it, it deals with a very heavy topic. Um, and I think you're brought in to care about the these sisters so quickly and reading about the the struggles with their migration and their their family, losing their parents, losing their connections. Uh, the, I found myself very bogged down by the beginning of the book. And so I found it helpful to see that oh, there is a daughter that comes and they are finding a path. I um, really enjoyed the book in a lot of ways, but I also had some just stylistic issues with it. I really did um, appreciate just learning more about the history, because aside from, you know, the free Tibet movement, I haven't really looked into what that means. Um, and so it was just really interesting to kind of go back to the, the beginning of that, but then also just remembering that these people are still living in exile. Um, and just how weird that is to be removed from your homeland for decades um, and yet still consider it your homeland. Um, 
I really liked the time jumps as well. The first one I was angry at because I was all excited. I was about to get my little romance story and then it jumped <laughs> way into the future. Um, but I did really like that, that format of storytelling. Um, my biggest issues with it were honestly that I, I had a hard time distinguishing between the characters as far as the voices um it all kind of sounded like the author's voice to me um and that particularly jumped out at me when um our narrator Lamo um was 14 and she goes on this pondering about the the missionaries teachers that are working there um, and it just seemed like a lot more profound of a thought than a 14 year old would have. Um, and that's kind of when I first started noticing it. But then I noticed that whether it was Lamo or her sister Tenki or her daughter, um, they all just kind of sounded like one person. And that person spoke very eloquently, but it just was missing a little bit there for me. Um, I also really liked the the jumps in chrono in chronology and the um, the different narrative voices. I really liked that this book centered female voices for the most part. I think we only got um, one male perspective, like his section. And um, again, like I didn't know anything about so much of what happened in this book, and the just the. Um, sort of the connections between the spiritual world and the natural world and how they're so entwined, um, even within the people in the book. I really loved that part. And um, I also found it interesting to read right now, um, just to read about people in exile and stateless people. And, um, you know, I listened to this interview with the author and she was saying like she couldn't, in order to research this book, she couldn't go to Tibet to do that, even though she's Tibetan. And that really struck me. Um, so yeah, I, I really loved it. I think it was beautifully written. Um, I kind of agree with what Anne said. Like there was a couple times where I was like, wait, who is, who is this again? I'd forgotten which time I jumped to, except for, I think that Tanky, that sister's section, once she was older and living in Canada, that felt different to me. That felt like more, um, stream of consciousness almost. And like, um, and I just think that was indicative of her, her mindset at the time. I'm resonating so much with what you all have said, because I've similarly, I listened to the audiobook and uh, it's actually read by different narrators, which helped um, with the voice issue that you all experienced while reading it on paper. But even then I was like, there were points where I was like, okay, this is a lot of like, drawn out nostalgia that we keep coming back to and again it like comes in waves but that might also be the grief of being a stateless person um just resonating through the generations uh but i really really loved the vivid descriptions of spirituality the connections to the land it reminded me a lot of like that first section of chinua achebe's things fall apart where they talk about um before the missionaries came in and the influences and changes, how just what the culture was like and how people lived. And I really, really appreciated that. Um, and Lucy, you're also right. Like I, I felt like this was such an interesting and timely read for this particular moment, given everything that's going on right now. Um, and just drawing on the parallels. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, so, so many things to think about. I I was wondering, you know, I heard uh, some of you say that you didn't know a lot about Tibet and I didn't either. Like, has anyone looked at a map of Tibet? I, I looked it up and I was shocked by how big it was. Like, it's at least a third of a size of China, which is also very huge. And it's like very large. I, I was quite surprised by it. And I was thinking about how many people had to, like how many people were actually displaced from such a large space. 
and it because of the way people lived you know the way that it was described like there must have been so many different groupings of it and it seemed like in the story that nepal was not the only place that they were displaced to but india as well um and other locations so i found myself very curious about those stories yeah i went and um just looked well there was a map in the beginning and i too was struck by the size of because it also seemed like nepal was so small compared to tibet being so big and i'm like they're all <laughs> getting sent there um but then i looked up just the history basically since the chinese invasion in um 1949 and then going from there and just like the the destruction the loss of lives but also of like temples and monasteries and cultural um places and and the history and the pillaging and um it, that was really interesting to read that and then think about all the the loss in this book and i think that did help um a little bit with like some of the nostalgia i do think you know i think that that to me that that just started to feel like loss and like a constant reminder of loss and and um and when i tried to learn more about the area it just the, that's the thing that struck me the most is the the loss and the disconnection and um yeah so i think that that seemed to be reflected in a lot of the writing i kept thinking back and i can't remember uh, someone if you remember chime in the book we read about the man um from guam and the idea of a sense of homeland and whether or not it's where you you spent the majority of your time or any of your time. I kept thinking back to that and to our, our concept of what home is and can you have more than one home? Uh, and it, it just made me realize how, how much I take for granted the, the sense of home that I have where, where I live and where I'm from. I, I just, I found this book a heavier read. And I think a lot of that was because just thinking about not having that relation to home and not even, even the past you found to it, the relationships with the people who you had from there, you were constantly seeing those ties have to sever as well. But at the same time, it's a it's a it's a heavy situation. So I felt like it was it was fitting for the book to be that way. But I I just keep circling back and the the way that it ended, I not to completely jump to the end of the book, but with the the return as much as you could and the eating of the earth. Oh, it just I, I finished it only a few hours ago. I was racing the clock, but it just gave me this this shiver of connection and this gratitude I am carrying now uh, and in the forefront of my mind for being able to have that connection to my home. Thanks for making that connection. I hadn't thought about it. Um, you're referencing Craig Santos Perez, who wrote from Unincorporated Territories and actually just won the National Book Award for Poetry. Um, which is really, really exciting for, for that particular series. Um, I hadn't made that connection because that, that question was also ringing through my head because a lot of times we see in immigration narratives, at least, we see people kind of adopting the culture and the communities that they reside in. But I didn't see that here, right? I That people were still very much like, Tibetan, you know, even second generation or first generation, I guess, you know, like having been born in Nepal and growing up elsewhere, but she's still very much like of Tibet. And, and I was really, I, I, I was curious about what forces kind of led to that. Is it is it that they grew up with, is it that they grew up in a camp and that changed like how you are, right? You're kind of, the refugee status doesn't go away. The camp is still called a camp, even though it's been there for decades. And 
and uh, yeah like what or is it is it that your role in society is still like minimal it was interesting to me when we did get the perspective of like what happens when someone like makes it out or like lives in a different neighborhood and you know earns money are they better integrated and it just didn't seem like it to me i don't know if anyone else got a different impression or the same no i agree with that and i think some of it has to do with um maybe this constant sense of impermanence like i mean it felt like in the beginning they were you know they kept moving and moving and then also this sort of idea is narrative that you're going to go back, you know, like they left, they buried all these things there. And, you know, I think about like, um, sample sample, whose father said like, no, you know, I'll show you this picture of your mother when we get back and all these things that were kind of like, it's like this constant waiting almost. So does that ever let you completely, um, integrate or, or dive into the spaces that you're living in even and I, then i think some of that probably is inherited it's probably trauma that gets passed down and just that sense of impermanence but that feeling of when we get back i can see that needing something that you would need to have as you are leaving somewhere to, even if you don't fully believe it or know that there's uh not much chance just the hope that you can come home again but yeah, that would make it much harder to to create a new home because there's some part of creating a new home that means letting go of your your prior one. Speaking of like uh, burying objects and things, I think one of the biggest themes in this book is the statue that, you know, um, the coup that keeps coming up again and again. Um, when they need it most, you know, the reverence for it, the fact that it's the only surviving item after uh, temples have been pillaged and all of that. And I think it brings up a, another big question that we contended with in their last book, which is like, where do objects belong? You know, um, especially when foreigners purchase it either through more ethical means or less ethical means, depending, you know, um, you know, where does it belong? Does it belong in the museums? And I was wondering if uh, what you all thought about that and whether this added to the conversation around, uh, you know, artifacts uh, and who it belongs to for you. Gosh, I was so happy when she stole that, when she went back and, and paid attention. It was, and I am a pretty uh, rule driven person more than I should be, honestly. And so it just felt like such a victory when she went and, and took it and brought it to her aunt. I think that, you know, this is something that we are starting to hear more about and talk more about and think more about who. I mean, it it truly is ridiculous thinking about these important things that are being pillaged, whether whether with violence or without and taken away. And just thinking about the fact that it is only recently coming into more common discussion. I think about the classes that I took in undergrad, which, you know, was what? 13 years ago, but it was 13 years ago. That's not that long ago. And we didn't, we didn't talk about any of this as we were touring museums and studying other cultures. The fact that these things were taken, I think is, oh, it, it clearly it makes me very angry because I'm having a hard time spitting out words. Um, and so I really appreciated that it was a part of the book. And that it, but it wasn't just there to highlight, isn't this a really lousy practice? Because it, I feel like it tied, tied to the story more and the idea of the protection that it brought and the connection that it um, gave between Samful and um, Dolma in the end, that it really facilitated some of those things, um, but that it also then gives the opportunity to really think about 
not just within the story, but outside of it as well. Well, and I think it's interesting because it's um, not, it's not something that is uh, obsolete. Like they're still using it as a spiritual relic. So that adds another layer of complexity to it. Cause it's not like this thing from 700 years ago that somebody dug up and nobody's done anything with it. Not that it's good for that to be getting sent around, but um, it especially doesn't make sense even if you know there was a tibetan museum for it to be there because it's not a retired object um i don't know if that makes sense but yeah that struck me too as well i mean i think that it's like still um in use and that it was really interesting to think about these two sides of it these these people in canada who were like acquiring art and it was an acquisition and they still felt good about it. Like they felt good about themselves. They had this sense that they were open-minded and they could see the world and they were, you know, um, sensitive to the, to the culture. And yet what they're acquiring is, is something that is important to the people who use it and that it has a certain use. Like it's supposed to be, yeah, not like you're saying, and not even in a museum, it's supposed to be with the people who need it the most. Um, and I just thought that bringing that conversation about like the acquisition of, of cultural items and art, um, no matter how they're acquired, but then comparing it to something that is like the value for some people, it doesn't really even have to do with how it looks or the, 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 the artistry of it has more to do with, um, the spirituality of it. And those two things were so vastly different. I was particularly taken by the role of Tibetans, right? So like in in sell, acquiring and selling these objects, you know, for the fact that Sample is the one who sold the coup and, uh, and then like started acquiring other materials to sell other artifacts to sell and it was interesting for me like this was one of the most interesting parts of the book was just how layered that whole thing was you know it was very obvious that he was not viewed well when other people learned about what he was doing they kind of stayed away from him or he was like slightly ostracized him and his family was slightly ostracized by the community saying like oh this is kind of like a dirty business and we don't want to be involved in that or we don't want to associate with that but it was also like such a necessary thing to get out of the poverty that they were experiencing and to actually make any sort of headway into because it funded you know it funded schooling it funded like upward mobility for the next generation so I was just, it's, it was so complicated and complex in the book. And I really appreciated that. Yeah. I thought when um, you saw very early on that Samful recognized the power that money and wealth had. Um, and, you know, when they got that, what was it? Five rupee? It was a, it, oh, there yeah, was the, some, the money that they, they got when they were children and they lived the afternoon of luxury. Um, and that was one of the few areas of the, the things that Sample wanted that he maybe had some control over. Mm -hmm. He couldn't bring back his father or stop his father from drinking. He didn't even know who his mother was and had no path other than trying to find these buried things that may or may not actually have her picture in it. Uh, but the thing that he could do was find a path to get some money. Um, a ethically muddy one is, is perhaps the nicest way you could describe it, but it was, it was the one agency that I think he could find. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he was a uh, um, an apt character for sort of that story arc because he had been, you know, he's always been this outsider. He's an orphan, and then he's a monk, but that didn't work out. 
and he's sort of been abandoned by the world because he's he's stateless like all of them but then any other connections he has are are he doesn't have any connections and so it's like what is the thing he has to do to survive and um so even though it did seem ethically muddy i think that 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 his role in that made him a very interesting character well and we see um you know, we see different routes of trying to achieve success. And um, like with Tenki, she had the opportunity for education, but because she was Tibetan and because she didn't receive the initial education, um, she had a hard time kind of keeping up with things. But so you have the kind of pride of the camp and somebody who everybody's counting on to make good um, struggling. So it, if you've got the stars struggling to make it, it makes it a lot more understandable why somebody who does value money is going to find whatever way they can to make it because there aren't a lot of options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. Um, I, I'm curious, since we've been talking about Samphal a little bit, can we talk about the romance or <laughs> the pining thing of this part of the story? I don't know what folks' impressions of that was. <laughs> I just wanted to smack both of them upside the head several times. Um, it it felt like uh, Lamo and Samfel were just doing everything they could to not be together without actually trying to not be together. Um, it's like constant second guessing what the other person must think of you. Um, but I think it, I don't know. It was really frustrating. <laughs> and the thing you describe, Anna, is like what makes romance romance novels work. It's the, you be, as the reader having more information and you see oh, if only you would talk and communicate. Um, so I found it kind of interesting that we we still got that in this book, uh, but then it's also very clearly not a romance and they, they never managed to get that. And now we have cleared our miscommunication and can live happily ever after. But that wouldn't have that wouldn't have fit the rest of the book. But I appreciated seeing those bits of other genres in this, even though, yes, you just want to say, listen to each other, talk to each other. I was honestly like super mad at Sanfal on behalf of Lamo, because I feel like at least Lamo is more forthcoming in the way that she spent time with the um, with him or even like the interest that she showed him, but he's the one who kept leaving her. I mean, like, especially that first time after she falls ill and then he just disappears from her life. And then again, also after they reconnect as adults, that to me was an extremely F boy move where I was just like, mm, I don't know about this. So I was actually when the author gave us some false perspective, I side-eyed his rationale for leaving uh, quite a bit because I was like, mm, is that really why though? <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, I mean, obviously part of that is communication gap, but I, I was just quite frustrated. I was like, she doesn't deserve this. His ego felt very fragile that he couldn't potentially take her not being interested in continuing a life and that it was better just to leave. Yeah. Except she she was very interested and she showed you. <laughs> but I get it. I mean. I did, talking about earlier the time jumps, 
Um, and I was saying that first time jump where you felt like they were about to fall in love and then it jumps um, mm -hmm. to her daughter and then, or does it jump to Tenki and we see her it jumps, daughter? It jumps to her daughter. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you get like you start that and you're like, okay, is she his son? Is she his son? Like da, 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 da. But then um, you start hearing from Tenki all these like <clears throat> side eyes at him. And it makes you go, whoa, what happened in the intervening years? Mm -hmm. And it was cool to see those, those blanks being filled in as you went. Um, Cause you don't, no, like, did he cheat on her? Did he, you know, run away? Like, what happened? Um, and it was just a cool way to unfold that story. Yes, yeah, so those blanks were being filled in. There was one part where they, like, were looking back to when they were younger. And um, I think at Lamo's remembering that, like, they in to, when they were together, in the same camp as children, that period of time was like a month or less. It was, it was like very short. And that struck me because I, had, I hadn't really thought about that because it felt like it was a lifetime because it was so much part of like her identity, you know, like what she was constantly thinking about. But then also like is a month, a lifetime when you're that age and also when you've when you the rest of your life seems so impermanent so it, it was um that just really struck me and i think that what you're saying and like the way that we were going back and kind of filling it in it was interesting to have that thought come later in the story for me that that lingering felt really familiar i feel like I've seen aunties in my like Bangladeshi community, like they've done that where it might've been a short period of time, whatever the connection may have been. Um, but then they remember it so vividly and hold on to it and talk about it. And um, even like the briefest of encounters are repeatedly reshared i think the verbal sharing or even just the holding on to that happens culturally quite a lot where um it's the same stories get told over and over again and that's what keeps it alive and i feel like this is one of those things too where or like in this community quite a few things are kept alive simply by telling the story over and over again yeah I did wonder, like, I think she did a good job of closing a lot of or tying up a lot of loose ends in the book, even with the time jumps and all. But I was, um, I, one, one thread that I don't think was closed was Tanky's story. Like, there were some details about, like, the hurt that she felt, I think, in, it, um, and when Semfel was recalling a memory of Tenki and he talked about how she, it looked like she reacted as if he was going to hit her and that she didn't even try to defend herself. And then there was nothing to expand on that. I really kind of wanted to know a little bit more about her because I feel like we got a little bit of her in Canada, a little bit of her life in India, but we didn't really close the loop on her. And I wish I had learned more about her. Yeah, I agree. She was the character I would have liked to hear more about um, and more from her perspective. Um, you know, I'm always interested in sibling relationships in these these books we read. And I think uh, between her and Lamo and especially the letter, the letter that Lamo chose not to share and thinking about the potential diverging of paths, um, I would have liked to read more about their relationship as sisters, as adults. Um, so I'll, perhaps we didn't get as much of that because they were countries apart. Um, but yes, if 
if there were any character in this book that we would get more from, she would be the one I would choose. It also feels like she was the most robbed of closure. Um, you know, she did, she got the coup, which is fantastic, but, you know, not getting to come and say goodbye and not, um, yeah, it, it felt a little bit like she was just left in an apartment by herself. <laughs> yeah, and I did, um, I agree with you, but I feel like there's a piece of her story that we weren't getting because it, um, it, like when like when she reacts, like she's almost going to be hit. And I feel like there were maybe some other times where it seemed like the story was kind of skirting this idea that she had experienced something, but maybe it, it like, and if it was something violent, I don't know. I just felt like, I felt like I was almost going to get some other detail and I didn't get it. And I always kind of was wondering like what happened to her, but maybe what happened to her is just what happened to her and and she her grasp on like she seemed to be the closest she was pulled the most i think between these worlds of like you know um spiritual world and and natural world and kind of this um her grasp on on what space she was in didn't always seem to be clear to her um and and maybe some of the violence she experienced is just the the life that she's led and, and even trauma that she inherited. But I just I did feel like there was something that we weren't getting, some detail that was either forgotten or withheld. I don't know. It is a pretty hefty book. It's long. Um the audiobook was like 15 hours. <laughs> And uh, so, um, I, I mean, there there is a lot of story in there. So I wonder if that that also has something to do with the, with that. Um, it, it, in that way, it is very much an epic, multi generational epic. Yeah. I started at the very beginning, uh, just writing down every name that I encountered. Uh, because I didn't know whether it was going to be an important person or just somebody that was getting a name. Um, and I found that very, very helpful for me. Um, it also helped me notice that uh, somebody that was at the camp at the very beginning um, was one of the people that they talked to uh, as they were traveling through northern Nepal. Because... Um, he, he was a friend of Ten Keys named Pemba, and he was Po Pemba uh, when we saw him again, which that's something that I never would have actually caught. Um, but he's the one that, you know, is asking them where they're from and then talks about knowing the camp. And it's because he was there when they were little kids. Thank you for sharing that, Anna. I had I had missed that. What a lovely connection. One strategy I used um, for something like this is like, I actually read the summary of the book. I typically do not when I'm reading because I don't want it spoiled, but I did read a summary of the book just so I knew where the overarching arc was so I could position myself. So if that's helpful to anyone who's listening, um, do that and maybe then you won't feel quite as lost because it does feel foreign when you enter the story until you are like a lot more familiar familiarized with the characters and the landscape yeah were there any other parts of the book that or the story that um you wanted to discuss or bring up today um i just i don't know if there's much to discuss but i really liked that uncle character um yeah. And his name's not coming to me, but he was one of my favorites and the way he just like adopted those girls and they became his daughters all the way through the whole story. You know, um, he just really like, I just, I, I really loved him as a character. 
Yeah, I think the moment that I felt uh, the strongest for him was when she was getting married um, and he went around saying like, my daughter's getting married, my daughter's getting married. And it was just like, oh, yeah, that was really, really touching. I I was like, yeah, he's a, he's a proud dad because in, a, in many ways he was their dad. Yeah. I also loved, and this is another character whose name I don't remember, but um, the older woman who Lamo went and lived with for a month or so, and that feeling that she got that I, if I need to be a woman who lives alone, I, I can be. And goodness knows she did end up needing to be a woman who could live alone. Uh, and I love this this woman who was immediately accepting of this person, her nephew, I think, had sent the stranger who had been sent to her and had taken her in and another parental figure, um, seeing that these these girls who whose parents couldn't be there for them to to see the community step in um, was very touching. I have to say, like the I wasn't too familiar with like Tibetan culture and how it treats gender, but I was very happy to see like the nuanced ways, like women are placed in really important positions, right? Their mom was essentially a priestess and Oracle and people came to her and trusted her and it came from all over the place to ask um, advice and seek blessings. And then also the fact that their star child who, you know, they were supporting to go to school and make it out of the camps was also a girl. And um, that there are examples of women living quite independently and just, I don't know, it's a, uh, I think it challenged some of the stereotypes that I might have had in my head of like what it is just based on how South Asian culture that I've experienced has been. Um, and I really, really appreciated that. I appreciated seeing, I mean, there's, of course there were gendered roles, but I think there was like less. So yeah. Well, um, well, this seems like a fairly natural end to the conversation. Thank you all for reading the book and engaging with it. I really appreciate having this space to talk with you all about it. Thank you. You select such broadening books, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I do too. So These great. are books I wouldn't have picked up a lot of them, so. All right. Well, um, I hope we hope to see you next month. We're reading a novella. It's quite short. It's actually <laughs> the second in the series, but you don't need to have read the first to, um, to follow the second. And it's kind of like a stories within stories, which is also really, really fun. So, um, yeah. Talk to you all next month. Thank Bye. you. Yep. Bye.